Nice start. Yeah. Nice start. Welcome to I Want a Doctor. Today we're going to talk about how hormone replenishment can lower blood sugar levels. And I'm Dr. David Rosensweet. I'm Joshua Rosensweet. You're live with I Wonder Doctor. We're live with I Wonder Doctor. <laughs> we are. We're here <laughs> with you. <laughs> so this came out of a question that someone mailed in and they asked, is it true that if you do hormone replenishment, and that goes for both men and women, right? Yes. That it can lower um, blood sugar levels. And I was surprised personally, even after all that we've done this, to learn that the answer to that question is yes, it can. Yes, because blood glucose levels, very important stuff. Oh my God, as far as big stuff that has emerged over the last 50 years, we don't want to have an elevated blood glucose. And so many things factor into that. I mean, most people are familiar with excessive carbohydrates and sweets raising fasting blood glucose, yeah. but they're not the only thing. For example, the biological stress response, fight or flight, shoots out these powerful hormones to prepare us to run or flee from a saber-toothed tiger, or moms have been known to lift cars off of entrapped children. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of biology to that. And the two major hormones are cortisol and adrenaline. You've all probably heard of that. Right. They shoot up and they do so many things. The muscles get stronger. We can run faster. Astounding the difference of increase. And the blood glucose is raised for a very good reason. Because our brains and our muscles really want rocket fuel if we're having to do something intense. If I've got to do something intense, I need those sugars. So the body has figured out how to put those sugars in my bloodstream, get it to my brain, get it to my muscles. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the biological stress response isn't just adrenaline and cortisol, it's a lot of things. Yeah. It's also estrogen, testosterone, DHEA, all these empowering hormones and, and also some neurotransmitters. And so, in a true fight or flight biological response, you get all these coming out. For yeah. example, in a young woman who is training maybe excessively for the Olympics or something like this, so many of these young women that you see because they're so intense training, it's so stressful on them, that uh, they're really calling out their cortisol and their adrenaline and their estrogen and their testosterone, and their DHEA, and their thyroid. Well, you keep calling out that estrogen, and instead of going down the female pathway, it goes down the stress pathway. And so many of these young women that you see in the Olympics, they are not menstruating. Same with young men. A lot of young men seems to be epidemic today, more so in these more modern times than when I was growing up as a doctor. They're losing their erection. And we didn't know that. We knew about the women athletes. Yeah. But when Viagra hit the scene, <laughs> and Cialis, and these things that can restore the power of the erection, yeah. in a funny way, they work for a special reason, and yet it's not the main reason. The main reason that young men lose their libido and lose their erections is their testosterone level is dropped. Right. So I know I'm telling quite a story here but I will promise to get this to blood glucose in case you <laughs> wondered if it had anything to do with your question. Yeah, right. <laughs> so if you keep placing intense demands on your biological fight or flight response, when you're real young, you keep up with it. We have just such amazing duplication systems and, uh, when we're young, but if you keep putting the strain on those systems, we our bodies can't keep up with the increased demand. And you have women and men in their late 20s and early 30s and mid 30s and later 30s and early 40s, they have diminished hormones. Yeah. Diminished estrogen, testosterone. 
And as you've said before, we always need these hormones. These hormones are fantastic for every year of our life, all the way up to 130 or whatever we make it to. <laughs> we still need testosterone. Absolutely. We, for a woman, or probably a man too, we still need estrogen. These are Absolutely. Yeah. For a lot of reasons. We just can't make them. We wish we could, but our, we make less of them. Yeah, we've, we fatigue the glands and, yeah. the, and, the, and the ability to produce this stuff. Yeah. And then, what happens when you're in your late 30s and your estrogen has dropped some and your progesterone has dropped and your thyroid has dropped and your testosterone has dropped if you're a man and a woman? When you trigger the stress response, the fight or flight response, you don't have those to be recruited as well. So what do you get? Increased cortisol and adrenaline. And that blood glucose raises when that happens. You're not getting the across the board participation of all these nice hormones. You're getting an emphasis of adrenaline and cortisol. They raise the blood glucose. And if it keeps happening, you get something called insulin resistance. You wind up having trouble with this major hormone that allows the, the glucose in the blood to go into the cells. Yeah. And instead of going into the cells as it should, your cells become resistant to insulin and you get insulin resistance. So where all of this, all, let me see if I understand this correctly. If I overuse the fight or flight response, I end up depleting these really important hormones that I need Thus, cortisol and adrenaline kick in more than they would have. Thus, I increase blood sugar. So my follow the bouncing ball is this. If I am in my 40s, happy birthday to me, by the way. Yes, happy birthday <laughs> to my beloved Joshua. <laughs> if I am in my 40s and I have diminished, let's say in my case, because I'm a man, testosterone, or if I'm a woman, estrogen, I'm not necessarily going to be able to re-ramp these things all the way back up all on my own, am I? Right. The value of hormone replacement therapy, as it's commonly known, is one of the ways that I can lower my, if I've got them, raised blood sugar levels. Exactly. Yeah. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah. Because it's a classic case of hormonal insufficiency and hormonal imbalance. So if you've got less estrogen and testosterone, female or male, yeah. and you've got to use more insulin, I'm sorry, more cortisol and adrenaline, if you replenish the lowered estrogen in women and testosterone in males, or in both, yeah. then you can use less um, cortisol and adrenaline, thus yeah. your blood glucose doesn't go up as high. Yeah. The moral of the story, always is the same. Get these hormonal, hormones balanced. Yeah. Always, whenever you need to. Yeah. Because elevated blood glucose, not okay. Not okay. We've learned a lot about how people age and how people get ill, and there's a lot of factors, of course, but related to causes of nutrition issues, toxicity issues, exercise issues, and how we respond to stress, the bottom line is things deplete. And you, one, of the, one of the possibilities from all those causes, and in this case stress, and nutrition plays a big role in here, you can get elevated glucose. Would you go this far? Let's say someone was in their 30s and they went in for their annual checkup and the doctor told them, ooh, you're diabetic or ooh, you're pre-diabetic. Should they be checking a box called my goodness, I need to go to a hormone specialist, yes. even in their 30s, That's right. and consider getting a I hormone. I sure, absolutely. And that's the new day that we're in. For yeah. one thing, it can happen in your 30s. It's probably happened throughout history. And, but and now we're sharp enough to... It's not like um, for a woman, menopause has kicked in, or for a man. Well, in an interesting way, it's more subtle than the severe hot flashes yeah. that we associate absolutely with menopause, for example. But there are the subtleties there. Now, I find that it takes a specialist in menopause and in hormones to really discriminate the symptoms and to do the sophisticated testing 
that can really flesh this out in the open. Yeah. Because it's not the common testing that's going to reveal this. The testing that would reveal it, and you know, if this were possible, may the day come that every young woman and every young man in their, when they're 21 or 25 should do a 24-hour urine hormone test when they're at their healthiest peak to see what their normal levels are. Now this isn't going to happen necessarily. So then when they're in their mid-30s, they can actually detect by special testing that the hormone levels have dropped. Yet, anyone who is really well trained in dealing with hormones and menopause can ask specific questions that are going to reveal the subtle drops in the estrogen in women and the testosterone in males. They're going to they're going to be able to question their way into that patient and go, look at this. Y this sounds so much like the hormones have dropped too low. At which point you do a trial of replenishing. And if the replenishing of the estrogen in women or the replenishing of the testosterone in males gets the hemoglobin A1C, the one of the best measures of long-term glucose blood levels, yeah. or even the fasting blood glucose, oh my, it, it's a terrific thing. You, you've done a, a reasonable uh, uh, test to see if it works, and if it does, you, boy, you catch something early and you get that blood glucose to drop. You said something to me a while ago, and I'm not remembering this exactly, so forgive me, but I went in for an annual checkup to a, a classically trained doctor, and the way that they looked at my blood sugar levels didn't trigger any, ooh, you got to act activity from them. By their standards, they went, you're doing great for a man in your 40s. Your blood sugar levels are great. Exactly. Now, you looked at my test yes, results. right. <laughs> and you said, you're doing great. And <laughs> right, yeah. there's room for improvement. Some, sometimes these things are subtle enough that they're not necessarily hitting every doctor's radar. Is that right? That is absolutely precisely correct. And I didn't know this. I mean, my classical training didn't teach me this. Yeah. But one of the things I noticed after decades of looking at hundreds and hundreds of tests, blood tests that looked at the fasting blood glucose yeah. and the, the range when I got out of medical school was 70 to 120. Right now, it's the mid-60s to a 99, and people are talking about lowering that upper number there. Yeah, the um, range of the numbers you want. The numbers you want, yeah. the, 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 the reference range. But what I started noticing over years, not only with blood glucose, but with hormones, with everything, that the younger people, the teenagers and the people in their 20s, the healthy ones, very often had a blood glucose in the upper 60s or low 70s. Yeah. And then I would look at the 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds, and I'd see so much more often, I'd see something in the mid-80s or upper 80s. You can see the trend as people, quote, got older. It didn't have anything to do with being older. Yeah. It had to do stressing of that mechanism for another decade or two. And so when I look at a blood glucose that is fasting blood glucose that's 98 or 85, I'm going, hmm. It's Mileage still in the reference range. Still in the reference However, range. However, why not catch it early? Exactly. Yeah. And you do want to catch it early. Yeah. Because it's one of the most, there's many things that really matter yeah. to late life ability to think and talk and all kinds of other functions. And one of the big ones is the, how the glucose and insulin work together otherwise ultimately leading in diabetes if they don't work to, together well. But you don't have to go all the way to diabetes yeah. to already have pr uh, trouble. Like upper level blood glucose levels in a young person can be a, a warning sign that look out for dementia 30 years later. It's yeah. gotten that well studied medically. So this is why I love to linger on this. And we've, gotten, we've gone into a lot of really important detail here, but just to get back to the basic facts, blood, high blood sugar levels aren't healthy for an extended period of time. Even in your 30s, you can start to get them. We well, can guess you can get them earlier, but they can be associated with lower, lower hormone levels. And for both men and women, possibly even in their 30s, if they're getting any clue that they're getting high blood glucose levels, it's time to start talking to uh, a, a hormone specialist. Yes, and you know, a general physician or nurse practitioner 
who pays a lot of attention to these issues, yeah. and a lot of them do, because the whole medical world has been alerted to the pre-diabetes issue. Yeah. And uh, they're gonna do more than just look at hormones. They may detect immediately, just from getting a dietary history, that someone is messing with their blood glucose, they're eating way too many sweets, they're overwhelming the glucose insulin regulating system. So someone could say to their patient, look, let's focus on diet first. Let's not go jump to hormones. You've got so much, ex you're straining that system so hard that I know it'll be a piece of work to rein in the simple carbohydrates, but this is good for you to do. I can see myself listening to this yeah. and going, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but a hormone replacement therapy is dangerous, and if I'm a woman and I do it, I might get breast cancer, so is it worth it? And in a man, if you're doing it, the, there was a time when they used to be concerned about prostate cancer. Yeah. So I'd like to make a blanket statement. Yeah. Normal hormone levels do not cause cancer, ever. Yeah. <laughs> Now, people can get cancer for various reasons. Right. And because of a technical issue of breast glandular tissue or prostate tissue having estrogen receptor sites or testosterone receptor sites, if someone has exuberant levels of those hormones, they're going to grow a little faster. But that's not the issue. It's how did they cause it. And yeah, I'm losing track of a point that you brought up just moments ago. Basically, it's, it's something you've said in other ones, that the benefits of hormone replacement outweigh the consequences. And yes. the one that I've, you've told me a lot of times that really amazed me the first time you told me was the big fear, at least in women, is that if you do hormone replacement, you increase your risk of breast cancer. And it turns out, if you're doing it right, that it goes down. I know I'm quoting Yes, you and here, that's what I was trying to recall in the moment. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And here's a young man in his 40s who knows a lot about <laughs> menopause and hormones and breast cancer risk. Yeah. Yes, the, one of the most famous studies that was ever done in the world of hormones on pregnant Mary urine treatment uh, of, of women, there was two arms of that study. One of them had a, a pure preg uh, pregnant Mary urine otherwise known as Premarin, yeah. which delivers a lot of estrogen, horse estrogens, to a woman. The women who were treated with that alone had less incidence of breast cancer than women who went untreated. So that's the one you really want to address. Even the, what I would consider early day, early on, I, under, I have appreciation why they did that. Yeah. Now it's not the one that I would choose Today, now, this, the field has advanced so far that we can produce, pharmaceutical companies actually produce the pure molecules, extracting them from plants because plants are like us. Yeah. They have hormones. <laughs> they, the pharmaceutical companies extract the pure hormones. So you can get uh, hormones that are molecularly identical to the hormones in a male or female body, and you can administer those, and anyone who is on a well-constructed, well, -constructed, well um, uh, rep hormone replenishment, bioidentical treatment has less of an incidence of breast cancer than a woman who goes untreated. So let's start there. And yeah. all this is referenced in my book and in our educational series. So this is just isn't flying out of my ears here. <laughs> 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 so, at any rate, that's the thing for people to know. Yeah. Well, all of this actually got triggered by a question that we got from Sandy in Carlsbad, yeah. California. And so some of, we just, we just went into this in great detail, so some of it we might have already covered. But I loved her question. I'd like to yeah. read it if it's still yeah. worthwhile it's, it's here. So many elements and brilliant. I've seen that before, yes. All right, great. Well, here's what she said to us, or she asked. She said, does bioidentical hormone replacement impact blood sugar levels? I'll answer it. Yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Especially if estrogen is low to begin with. I'm currently on conservative dosages of bioidentical progesterone and testosterone, testosterone for a woman, um, and am concerned about the impact of bioidentical estrogen replacement on blood glucose, given that my fasting glucose hangs out in the low 100s in the pre-diabetic range 
since one year prior to the onset of menopause. Let me, let me stop you there. Yeah. One of the keys to Sandy's brilliant question that covers so many people, it's why we've chosen to open this show uh, with this, Yeah. is she's talking in general as far as hormones relate to her lower blood glucose of hormonal imbalance. And part of the deal with hormones is getting them balanced. You know, yeah. treating a woman with progesterone and testosterone, and I'm assuming she's perimenopausal, making a guess there, um, it's not enough. I mean, there's no reason why the progesterone dropped and the testosterone dropped, but the estrogen didn't. <laughs> but the art is getting these things as absolutely balanced biologically as possible. You want to get all these hormones balanced, and that gives you the best shot of addressing any hormonal component of an elevated fasting blood In essence, glucose. you're talking about customization. Every yes. single human m has a different replacement ratio. Some yes. woman might need more progesterone, another might need more biased, and you got to get all of those right so that they're in the correct right. relationship to one another. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to figure that out. I mean, earlier I alluded to an amazing thing, and we, want, we do have a mother who um, went into menopause and saw the beauty of getting her hormones corrected and the beauty of the 24-hour urine hormone test, and she sent in her very healthy early 20s daughter and daughter-in-law to be tested. Not because they had any complaints whatsoever, but she thought, wouldn't it be valuable that they, when they go into menopause to be able to compare uh, to their previous levels? And we never try and replenish to youthful levels in menopause, we never have to. But that would be an, uh, one of the most special ways to compare, but that's not the only way you need. We got a lot of things that we can measure um, to test out hormonal balance. Oh gosh, there's so many wonderful factors that someone who really knows their stuff are going to be able to ferret out and discover, rediscover a hormonal balance. And one of the tools we would use is the fasting blood glucose. You yeah. work with, you, you search for, you listen for symptoms of hormonal insufficiency and not hard. I mean, I could list some questions that I would immediately ask a woman in her 40s to detect levels that are lower than what she was used to in her 20s. I can yeah. think of 10 questions. I'm not going to do that right now. And if I thought that, oh, she sounds lower, I would start the replenishing process with reasonable levels, ultimately to test that those numbers were reasonable. That's a very important thing to do. We would do the 24-hour urine hormone test. If she says, wow, I do feel better, then we test her. And we do the 24-hour urine hormone test to make sure she's in precisely targeted ranges. And we test the fasting blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C. The proof is in the pudding. Now, Sandy's gotten more to this question, and this is yeah. what I thought was so extensive about this. Okay, let me see if I can find where I left off. Here it is. Even healthy carbs spike my blood sugar to abnormal levels in spite of the fact that I exercise and meditate daily, detox regularly, have optimal blood pressure and triglycerides, am lean, athletic, and eat a clean and healthy diet. I am hoping the proper dosage of bioidentical estrogen might be the key to lowering my fasting and postprandial glucose levels, and hopefully not raise these levels. And postprandial means like testing your blood glucose two hours after you eat. That's a very informative time. Yeah. But um, back to some other things that were said there. Yeah. And I encourage you to listen to the second hour of I Wonder Doctor today at 2 o'clock, because part of Sandy's question is going to appear there. And it is, she mentions that she's a, a, an exerciser. And a lot of people are impeccable exercisers. And exercise is so amazing, oh my goodness. One thing I can guarantee everyone in this audience and on the planet, that if you do the proper amount of physical exercise, you have no stronger tool that you can bring to the healing and longevity of your body and your life. 
It is the strongest, and you hear it everywhere because everyone is correct about that. And anyone yeah. who exercises regularly could tell you that. I mean, we go to the gym, yeah, and I know when I'm really keeping up with it, I can feel it. So it isn't rocket surgery to <laughs> figure out that exercise is good for you, and it's that yeah. powerful that you actually notice it. Like right. a, a lot of people take nutritional supplements, they may not notice it, it could be having benefit, but exercise, no one's missed. But what the question I would ask Sandy, I mean, when we burrow down into the details of any given patient and their stories, I wanna know, are they someone who are pushing themselves in exercise? And I, we go to the YMCA three times a week, yeah. And I f identified the frequent flyers at the YMCA that are pushing themselves. That is stressful. That triggers the biology, the fight or flight response. So even though they're getting some definite benefits from the exercise they're doing, they're not paying close enough attention to what their body wants, to what their joints want, to what their adrenal glands want. And usually, especially in today's supercharged culture, people tend to think more is better. So getting a sensitivity. So that's what I'd want to zero in on Sandy. Maybe she's doing it really impeccably. Yeah, the fact that she's a regular meditator, I mean, she's... That's great. She seems like the I'd want to know what's happening in her meditation, yeah. but it's, it's a winner, that's for sure. Yeah. And then the other thing relates to the mysteries of what elevates a blood glucose. And there's a phenomenal study that you can YouTube, the Israeli researcher, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what to look up there, but what they did is they implanted <laughs> these sophisticated blood glucose measuring devices, small, into someone's skin. Is this a TED Talk? It was a TED Talk. And uh, they measured and uh, their moment by moment blood glucose elevations or blood glucose levels. Yeah. And what was so revealing there is what made the blood glucose go up. Everyone believes that simple carbohydrates is gonna make it go up. And they're right. And they're right. And what was the mystical thing is that people are so individual that some people, they, if they eat excessive amount of meat or um, not even excessive, a large amount of protein, yeah. by very well-known biochemical pathways, some people genetically are gonna convert that to glucose, all of us will, but some do, are more likely to. And what, they, what I learned from it is you can't necessarily know exactly what's driving up your blood glucose. You ultimately have to test it. So what did I do? I bought one of those finger stick things, those uh, blood glucose measuring devices. Yeah, easy to find, relatively cheap. Yeah, every, every you know, the big deliverer from the sky <laughs> company <laughs> can deliver you up one or your local pharmacy has them. Every single one of them have them. They're called glucometers. Yeah. And um, the reason I chose that rather than having one implanted <laughs> <laughs> is what I, the implant technology isn't quite up to speed. So you got to cross check it with finger sticks a couple of times a day, but sorry for the diversion. Because ultimately who, someone who's got some mysteries why is my blood glucose raising? It doesn't make any sense. I'm eating such a careful diet. You got to test out every food. And many people are going to get many surprises. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, the ketone or ketosis diet became really popular, is very popular, and is very beneficial. And my goodness, Dr. Atkins gave us a, the original version of this, although the original version. There is a researcher out there who's pointed out that human beings, since they've been on Earth until recent times, were basically on a ketosis-producing diet. I'm not defining ketosis, but it was heavy animal fat, heavy fat, low carbohydrate, ever since the beginning of time. And that this new thing of non-ketosis, not enough ketone bodies because we weren't eating fat and we've been avoiding fat, such a misdirection in this planet, it was ridiculous, brought on by the carbohydrate food manufacturers. They came up with this idea for marketing that fat was bad and fat was what made you fat. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. Easy thing to sell. 
Yeah. It is, intuitively, it makes sense. Fat will make me fat. Why yeah. not? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. <but it> <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, I know this is splayed out into many different <laughs> conversations, but yeah. one of the things I loved about Sandy's question is that this is at the core of what's giving us, the every one of us, a challenge until we've all figured it out. But if you're having mysteries, Sandy, and you seem so committed to your own health, I suggest you get a glucometer and you test out every food because you could have some surprises. Because you already told me you were on a good, told us you were on a good diet, but that what this Israeli study showed that is so remarkable is, yeah, every individual who's not figuring it out easily really needs to test out all foods because you can have some surprises. I want to circle back to the core part of her question was, as I understand it, she's not on estrogen now. Yes. She wants to get on estrogen and she's concerned it might, if I'm reading her question right, raise her fasting glucose levels, something she doesn't want to well, do. Well, you, you can ultimately test so easily. Yeah. I mean, easily. You have to do that finger stick with that glucometer. Yeah. We all know what that feels like. <laughs> but um, the main thing is, <coughs> excuse me, number one, it is not healthy to have insufficient estrogen levels yeah. at any time of life. And so my, my strategy has been for decades, when you don't know what's going on, see if you can find stuff that's out of whack and put it back into place. And I don't want to oversimplify this, but as I think I understood it from what you said earlier, the odds are if she does take estrogen, it's not going to raise her blood glucose levels, it's likely to lower them. Exactly. Yeah. Now, of course, as a, you know, I'm repeating myself, but I'd want to ferret out from her story. And, you know, in, in our method, we send out a questionnaire that is so detailed. Yeah that when I read through that questionnaire, I get the clues because we designed it to get the clues. So you want to know where is Sandy's specific issues. Yeah. But always, you know, it, it's a sure thing. If she's running lower estrogen than her body likes, the likelihood of restoring decent estrogen levels, not enough to give her cramps or give her a heavy flow when she never had one in her life, or give her breast tenderness when she never had breast tenderness in her life, signs of excessive estrogen, no way. But restore it to decency, that, that's a strategy you definitely want to try when it would so shock me if restoring hormone balance did not lead to betterment. I would still, even if it didn't lead to betterment of her blood glucose levels, I would still keep those hormones at decent levels after and then the go reasons. after where else? What else could be causing? We, we've packed so much into this one. I'm thinking if I was listening to this, my head would start to spin yes. here. But th there's an obvious... Your head is not spinning. Well, I've sat in this chair a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not over there. <laughs> but I, I think it really boils down to just a couple key points. I, mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think it's this. Yes, they are interconnected. Yes, it matters to have low blood sugar levels. Yes, it matters to be on hormones when you need them. So what do people really need to do? They need to seek out a hormone specialist. If they're a man, someone who, a doctor who specialized in menopause, andropause. Yes, exactly. Right? <laughs> if they're a woman, someone who specialized in menopause. Yes. And if they're having high glucose levels, seek the kind of doctor who does the kind of nuanced stuff you're talking about. They don't have to do all this on their own. That's they right. Can, they can find a good medical professional, I would probably call them holistic or alternative, um, would be complimentary, the complimentary, functional, and they can help weed through them eating too much meat, not enough meat, all this amazing stuff you packed into one yeah. really complex, multi-tiered, valuable question, answer session here, but anyhow. And the traditional hormone specialists are endocrinologists. And my goodness, endocrinologists are so amazing. When someone's diabetes has gotten out of control, yeah, and not the only thing that they're expert at, oh man, you want an endocrinologist to help you get that insulin <laughs> and all the treatments that are necessary to bring a diabetes out of control. You want something, an endocrinologist to do that. Yet, endocrinologists have not taken on the specialty of menopause, usually. There are a few. Yeah. 
But really, when you're seeking someone who understands estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you really have to seek a menopause specialist or an andropause specialist. And if you go through our website and uh, click on ask, uh, find a doc, we can help you, one of our team members can help you find a physician who has special training in that area. But you do want someone, th and it's a new field. It, uh, it, it's and, only and these Just to slow down there for yeah. a second. Where we have this find a doc is in the menopause section of I Wonder Doctor. If you go in there, you'll see a link in there that says find a doc. You fill out the form and we can help connect you to a doctor. And it's, and it's menopause has really been our specialty, but there's a good chance we can help too with men as well. We can at least exactly. steer in the right direction. And ask your women friends who are in menopause. Yeah. And what you want to hear from them is two things. One, I love my doctor and nurse practitioner. They have helped me out so much with bioidentical transdermal for the most part, apply to your skin hormones. And number two, that they're doing the 24 hour urine hormone test. Woo! Yes. So you would call you that sort of a litmus test. I would. How do you know that someone's really at the pinnacle of the game yeah. in this day and age? They've made the it so far mark. to discover that what's been in, in used in research on hormones since the 1940s yeah. and has never been supplanted. I mean, if it could be, if something better could have come along, hey, listen, I'll be the first one to jump on the bandwagon there. But it's the 24-hour urine hormone test, and I'm going to assert it's the only one that is valuable for testing a woman who is or a man who's on hormones, taking yeah. hormones, ovarian hormones or testicular hormones. Yeah. So, oh my God, we've sort of spanned a lot of different <laughs> things here. I today. wonder everything, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, <laughs> I don't understand anything. <laughs> the, um, there, I, there's one last sentence in her question. I'll just read it to, to sure. wrap up hers. Uh, I've read some mixed opinions about estrogen replacement and would appreciate Dr. Rosensweet's feedback on this very important topic. I guess we've already covered it. I yeah, and I, and uh, we would love it someday if Sandy could call in so I could get specific with her about what, I mean, the most common thing that people learn is the big scare that happened that estrogens cause cancer. But again, I'd like to repeat it. A woman properly treated with estrogen, yeah. even the old-fashioned Premarin derived from horse urines, horse ma uh, mares urine, yeah. if treated properly, they have less of an incidence of breast cancer than women who go untreated. That's science. The one that scared everybody is the, another molecule was thrown in there, a very tricky molecule, and that's a whole other story that we cover in other locations. Well, this would be a very unique live Thursday in that we've managed to use up the entire time <laughs> <laughs> with one question, but there's, there's the truth. Yeah, it was we had a, big a bunch one. of great questions yeah. that we, you know, it's okay. We'll be able to come back to them next week. Yes, exactly. So, thank you, Happy doctor. birthday. Thank Happy birthday. You, I was there. <laughs> you were. You, you came into my arms <laughs> when you were this big. My hands. Small, small life fact. <laughs> my father delivered me. He was there for my birth. And he I was received the you. <laughs> Your mother and you did it, and, and God did an amazing job. I was there to yeah. be present for that miracle. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you all, and we will see you next week.